Greetings, music nerds, and welcome to Season 6 of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. I am your host, Steve Dawson, coming to you from the Hen House Studio here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm really excited to be bringing you this new season of shows coming to you on the first and third Wednesdays of every month. I have a great lineup of fascinating conversations with incredible musicians, songwriters, guitarists, steel guitarists, drummers, composers, who knows what else. I've been having an incredible time diving deep with these folks and I know you're going to enjoy listening. Just a reminder that this year I've taken out the short song samples through the show, as things have gotten way more complicated as far as legal use of music goes, so I'll be making an accompanying Spotify playlist to each episode, which you'll find in the episode's show notes and at the website at makersandshakerspodcast.com. So anytime you hear this cute little slide guitar sound, you'll know there's a track to go along with it on the playlist. We have some new sponsors this year, but continue to be largely listener-supported. Your help in keeping the show going is always appreciated, and you can do it with a one-time donation or a Patreon subscription. Patreon is a monthly payment of your choice, and when you sign up for that, you get a bit of added content as well as an ad-free version of the show to listen to. If you don't feel like kicking in any dough, that's cool too, but you can help by subscribing for free on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or just spread the word by sharing the show, following us on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and telling all your pals about it. You can get links to all this stuff, of course, at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Meanwhile, many thanks to our sponsors this season. Please check them out and let them know that I sent you. They are Isotope, Ear Trumpet Labs, Union Tube and Transistor, Black Mountain Picks, and Spectra 1964. Hey there, folks, and welcome back to season six of the show. This is episode number 123. And today I am bringing you a conversation with an incredible songwriter and performer who lives right here in Nashville, Tristan. Her full name is Tristan Gaspaderic, but she just goes by Tristan. That's what I'm going to call her, Tristan. So, yeah, I remember last episode when I said I was sick, but it wasn't COVID. Well, it was COVID, and man, did it kick my ass. I was down for like four days, but managed through it. I have a weird ringing in my ear now and a crazy toothache, and I went to the dentist, and he said it's because my sinuses got damaged during from COVID, <laughs> and they're pinching the root of my tooth. You can't make this crap up, man. Whew. Anyway, I survived, and great to be back, and uh, really excited to be uh, wiring and putting up finishing touches around the new Hen House studio here, and I have my first session in here tomorrow morning, so I gotta get it all tested right after I finish up here. So thanks for joining me, and uh, let's get into the latest episode. I first heard of Tristan on another podcast called Talk House that's really cool. And she was on there talking with, uh, who was it? Margot Price. They were talking shop, talking music. And uh, I thought she was really interesting and grabbed her album called Aquatic Flowers, which came out um, in 2021 and during the pandemic, of course. And for me, it was the perfect album for the time. You know how some albums just hit you and it's like the perfect music and the perfect melodies and sonically it's the best. And I don't know, for whatever reason... This was the perfect album for me in my COVID period. And I listened to it constantly during the early half of 2021, especially. And uh, it really was one of my favorite releases throughout the whole pandemic era. And, you know, Nashville is a really tricky place for indie artists and musicians. It's a, a tough town to get people out to a show. And, you know, unless you're on the upper echelon filling the Ryman for seven nights, no names mentioned, it can be a real grind at uh, some of the local clubs here. So I've been wanting to talk to some folks about what it's like to exist in that environment and what it means for them artistically. And also Tristan's music just seems totally otherworldly to me. Her melodic sense is incredible and the way her lyrics and music flow together is really unique and hypnotic. So I wanted to hear how she writes music and what her process was in making this amazing album, Aquatic Flowers. And the other thing is that she owns and operates a really cool vintage clothing store here in East Nashville called Anaconda Vintage. You should go check it out. It's right by Grimey's, the great record store, Grimey's. So uh, it was great to have her on the show and talk to her about what makes all that work and uh, her writing and performing. She has, I think, four records out under her name, Tristan, and I believe she's probably making another one right now. And she's out on tour fairly regularly, well, fairly frequently-ish. And she tours right now with her husband and co-creator, Buddy Hewen. And you can get info on all her projects and tour dates at tristan.com. 
And lastly, I'd like to put a shout out to the uh, folks who made donations or signed up to Patreon over the last couple of weeks. They are Aaron Heist and Jerry David DeChica. And he's Jerry has uh, contributed before, and I think I blew his name then, and I think I'm blowing it again now. Jerry David DeChica, DeSica, I'm so sorry, but um, that's that's who that is. And Jeremy Havel. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. Couldn't do it without you. I really appreciate all the help. And let's get down to it. Enjoy my conversation with Tristan. All right. Well, yeah, let's hop Let's hop in. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Your record, Aquatic Flowers, is probably my favorite record of the last year. Really? Yeah. Love Amazing. it. Amazing. And I was hoping we could talk about it. Of course. And some of the things that went into making it. And mm-hmm. also a little bit more about you, because I didn't know about you before this. I think the first thing I heard of you was a podcast you did with Margot Price. Oh, Talk House, yeah. Talk House. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I immediately, I don't know how I ended up listening to that. It's not a podcast that I know that well. Yeah. But uh, there you were talking about stuff, and I got your record, and uh, love it. My daughter loves it, too. Oh, good. Yeah, she's 15, and she's very excited that you're coming here today. The kids are, you know, the best deciders because they're so just driven right. by the experience of it they don't have any like this is good this is bad i'm supposed to like this i'm not they have no they just either want to get up and dance to it or <laughs> right. they don't care. especially my daughter who's extremely opinionated and if she likes something that that i like i usually try and um cash in on that and we crank it in the car and stuff it's good oh, yeah yeah as a parent, you're always looking for something to like do together. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure once they're older too, and they're teenagers, and they have all the angst and emotions, that it's you know you're even more like trying to make them laugh. A little. So much angst. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and and you have a a, do- a son, mm. pretty new. Yes, couple, he's almost three. Old. Three. Okay. Yeah, so he's basically same thing. A lot of angst and emotions yeah. and <laughs> a different kind of angst. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unbridled. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about this record for a minute. This came out during the pandemic, but did you record it pre-pandemic or what's the... We were the... finishing it. Um, as the pandemic started, we were finishing, we were like, had a deadline. Mm-hmm. And so we decided to just keep working on it um, because the deadline, I mean, for us really like deadlines help us focus especially having a kid and everything and so we we were kind of grasping for more time so we just decided let's take a little bit more time um truly time off and then come back because for me I'm very regimented about not really listening to what I'm doing unless I'm working on it Mm -hmm. so uh sometimes taking a week off is good in fact I know it's good because like in the middle of the process you mean oh yeah yeah well especially for mixing because my husband buddy Hewen he mixes everything and I'm a part of that process, but I sort of stay out of the tedium because A, I can't do it and I didn't develop that skill set. Yep. But B, I also like to be the person that can come in and make a quick decision because right. I haven't heard it. Yeah. And I know. Um, so I mean I am in involved in the mixing, which was always a frustration in prior records, like collaborating, you know, you're always kind of chopping your own ideas off and making room for other someone else's. And many times you're working with someone who is older, knows more and, um, or so they think, or so they've developed a career where they can be that way. And, you know, and you look at it like, Oh, I have to make everybody happy. I have to collaborate. And so when I get a mix back and there's a million things on it, you know, and then I'm chopping back, you know, it's interesting. My second record, I had a a manager who behind my back went to the mixer and told him to put more high end um, symbols and things because I'm very anti, I'm very anti symbol. If you might come in to play drums on my record, I might just remove, there might be no symbols there. I do that too sometimes to drummers. Yeah. And and we're not the only ones who feel that way. This is kind of a thing that, listen, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and get rid of all of it because I definitely still use it, but. So I would get mixes back with like crazy high end. And it's funny because right around the time I put out that record, you know, the Lord record came out like right after that. And it was kind of the no symbol vibe. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, you're just dealing with um, collaboration and in and, and two visions. So anyway, the point is we got to right. a place where we didn't have to, my husband and I have been working together for, I want to say 10 years. 
Now, what does he play? He plays guitar. Okay. He's one of those people that can play pretty much everything if he tries. Yeah. Um, it's kind of annoying. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a guitar player primarily, and um, and in the band, he's become. I mean, he'll be a co-writer if he brings me like a really good chord progression. Yeah. We'll sit down, we'll like you know, so he has some co-writing credit nowadays, and he. Um, he developed all the engineering skills and all the mixing skills because we were at a place where we were facing the recession in music and facing the budgets disappearing. Um, and so we decided, well, what do we, what do we like, what's still, who's still getting paid? Yeah. <laughs> and we realized that um, in Buddy, you know, we both Buddy and I had always shown interest in recording ourselves and I had always been, sort of longing to get to a place of freedom where I could like write a song and record it right then and there. And the demo was the recording maybe, Yeah. you know, if we were lucky, instead of trying to constantly gather 30 songs, go in the studio, crank it out real fast. And then. And sometimes you can't duplicate that magic that you put on a demo and that can get really frustrating too. You right? never sing it as good. Yep. Um, it just becomes something totally different. So I was interested in the purity of inspiration in the moment when I'm really like thinking it's the best thing I've ever made. So is the self-recording at home thing, is that new to you with this record or have you been doing that for quite a few albums now? No, I started really, um, my very first record that wasn't released on a label. It was just like, um, I used to stamp the CDs and try to sell them to make yeah. money at the felt covers. I was so, cause I, you know, it was back to CD, 10 disc CD burners. And you know, <laughs> did you have one of those? Um, my manager at the time did, and he would send me packs of a hundred of these records and I would stamp them and make sleeves and go to, you know, the copy shop and copy off lyrics and awesome. pull them up. I should have charged like 50 bucks for yeah. this. if I considered like paying myself minimum wage, you know, at the time, but no, I was just excited to do it. And um, I used to, sell those just because I needed something to sell because uh, I you know needed to pay for gas or pay the band or whatever. Yep. So um, started out doing that and that was Teardrops and Lollipops and you can stream that. It is. There's no physical uh, thing left of it? No. Okay. If you have one, hang on to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it and, and, and that sort of marked my moving to Nashville, getting a Mbox Mini, which was really not very good. Oh, I love those. But I, but it was great, you know. Sure. And I had a computer and a piano in my little room in, um, in Twelve South, yeah. which used to be where you could live. Not uh, so much anymore. Yeah. yeah. And I would, uh, and I worked at the tap room, Twelve South Tap Room, and I would walk down, you know, oh, and cool. do my waiting table shift, walk home, and and make music at night, and go to shows and that's kind of like what, how it started. And I was writing songs and recording them as demos and then giving them to a band and rehearsing a band and playing shows. And Buddy was doing the same thing with his band. Okay. And so um, we didn't converge until about like, I think three or four years later after. Like you didn't know each other at all. Like you, you... No, we met, we met within six, he, within moving here, I had met him um, eight months into moving here. Okay. And we didn't start playing music together until 2010. A so years, that was a couple of years later, yeah. mm -hmm. we, we went out, we were partners. Yeah. Um, but then his band broke up and what band was he in? Eureka gold was with like Jordan Lenning and Adam gold. And, um, and Jordan was dating Caitlin Rose. And it was this, this whole like really organic kind of let's go out every night music scene. I mean, the music scene in Nashville for me starts when I moved here, you know, it's like mm -hmm. 2007, who's doing indie rock? Not a lot of people, but there were some big players like Jeff, the brotherhood and those darlings. And so there was some serious, um, indie rock happening, which sort of felt like really close in and on the outskirts of everything else that was happening in mainstream music here, which I have always felt pretty disconnected from, but sure. I've carved out a nice life here with other artists. So my mother is working the store and she's What's the, what 60 store? Anaconda Vintage behind Grand oh, Hayes. Yeah, yeah. Store. yeah. Okay. So Anaconda Vin Vintage, that's your place. That's like your place. Like you own the my place. My sister and I. Yeah. Wow, cool. Mm -hmm. All right. I started out selling clothes at Fond Object, which was a little record store in Riverside Village. Yeah. 
It was the like most magical Nashville story. Coco Hames, who was staying in my house while I was touring, saw a huge pile of vintage clothes that belonged to Becca Cope, <laughs> who, um, you know, is on the scene taking photos and being kind of a very um, multi-talented, tactile artist person. And um, she was like, do you want to sell these clothes in our record store? I was like, yeah. So it it's started a good combo. that way. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's cool. You go on tour, fill up your van. Yeah. Bring it home. Clothe the people. <laughs> My daughter works at Hip Zipper, so. Oh, really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? If you can find a really, you know, focused young person, you know, come in. There's the fervor there. There's an intention. Do some Instagramming for you, you know, like. My kids are the best oh at it. Oh, my God, yeah. I don't know exactly where we were, but but I sorry. There there was a there was an like a kind of a burning question that was coming up in my mind, which is why Nashville? Like it just seems like an odd choice, kind of. Does it sort see, of see to me? Well, first of all, there's three cities: New York, L.A., and uh, Nashville. That was in my mind, okay. like where music was. If yeah. you wanted to write songs, and um, Nashville was affordable. It mm -hmm. was, you know, I'm working class person pay for everything myself. I could, you know, New York just seemed far away and it seemed, you know, New York stacks upward and there's just all these jobs reaching up to the sky and you look around you at these big buildings and you think someone in every one of these offices is doing a job with a salary for some business somewhere, some trade is happening and these people have a job managing it all. And it seems just fascinating to me that there's that amount of industry <laughs> in the world. Um, so going to New York seemed really huge, but I would like to retire to New York, get rid of my car and like live, you know, in Manhattan. So you wound up here, uh, but was the specter of like modern country music kind of something that freaked you out at all about coming here in the first place? Like for me, it was because I, I don't do that kind of music either. Well, but... I'm a songwriter, so I thought I can write country music. <laughs> was that kind of a thing that you were thinking too? Is 100%. That you would... Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I knew I could write. Yeah. I knew that I could come up with great melodies. I mean, I didn't know necessarily the politics or um, the, you know, career, you know, the people that live here kind of grow up, the people that grow up here kind of see how it works. And um, I think if you're in show business in anywhere or you have a family member and you can see how it works, you come up with kind of a, a knowledge and a wisdom about what's really going on. But I had none of that. Mm -hmm. I just knew that I could write a song mm -hmm. because, and I knew that I was good at it because everybody always told me, wow, how do you write songs like that? Mm -hmm. um, since I was very little. Really? Yes. It okay. was just sign of a thing I could do. Um, and didn't know what I wanted to sound like, but then I got into college and then, you know, I was like into David Bowie. I've like, you know, started really getting, I was into Bob Dylan, David Bowie. Um, I always loved the Beatles, but point is I sort of like developed, um, a sense of production around the time that I moved here, like what I wanted to sound like. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe that a song can be anything. And I know that it can because I, my own songs take many different forms, but yeah, I don't, Necessarily, I mean, I love country music. When I moved here, I learned all about country music because I loved the Everly Brothers. I loved the Leuven Brothers. I loved all the dual harmony singing yeah, Beatles. I, and, yeah, I can hear that. And I, um, I was, you know, loving Skeeter Davis and, you know, obsessing about Buck Owens and Roger Miller and kind of the really great songwriters like people so you who did have stories. A, you did have a, a connection with country music then in in that way I, like to I, that to that era anyway uh, when i moved here yes yeah. i absorbed what a great you know guitar i mean the best musicians in the world that you know chris scruggs was dating my roommate i got to see him play and learn from him and his family and mm -hmm. um just that's just an example of the experiences you can have living here, especially if you're a good songwriter, people say immediately let you in. So I, I came here and I really, it really happened fast for me to be let into a creative That's cool. environment. Was that group that you were involved in, was that based in East Nashville or in 12 South or where, where were those people that at that was, point? There was the basement, you know, yeah. West side, the mm -hmm. basement. Um, my first show though really was 
New Faces Night at the Basement, and then there was um, in Todd Sherwood at the Five Spot. Yeah. So I'm interested in like also how how people in this town, you know, I, I especially over the last couple of years, I've interviewed a lot of people via Zoom that aren't here, but being here. A lot of people come and go quickly. Um, a lot of people don't last here. You seem to be like firmly rooted here. You've got a store here. You've got not by not by design. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, was it always just a good fit for you? It, it just you know maybe I'm missing something about that or, or I don't or know if that's but, true. Yeah. I mean, I think there's more money in LA and there's more mm-hmm. money in New York where there's more people giving money. Yeah. And then like losing it forever because there's no money to be made in the industry anymore. (laughs) Um, And I think that there's a a mythology around those cities. Uh, But honestly, I don't think I'm good looking enough for L.A. (laughs) (laughs) And um, I don't know. I've always dreamed of moving to New York, to be honest. Um, For me, like creatively, I need a studio and I've always had a space and I've always been working towards my space. And New York seems like such a pain in the D to be in as a musician. I'm not into uh, like having to go places to go to my rehearsal space and the gear. And I just think the level that I operate at um, is just more comfortable here. I don't think it's that way here anymore. I think it's expensive here now. Do you play here much or do you just kind of do it like once or twice a year and not rely on it as a place to satisfy that side of what you do? So what happened very quickly for me was that I, you know, found a creative community here in Nashville and Jeremy Ferguson said, come over, let's make a record. And I was able to make a record, which was like incredible. And after that point, like as far as like creatively, the community mm-hmm. and the musicians outside of that, like business wise, or like getting to go on tour and having a team and all that, that none of that happened in Nashville. <laughs> I started working with um, some people in New York, mm-hmm. started playing there. And started um, touring to there to play those shows and then sort of, you know, kept Chicago and kind of built a little thing that way. And, uh, you know, then I got an agent and my first record came out on a label out of Brooklyn and um, they put me on tour. And so I started building um, nationally, Mm -hmm. um, touring the U.S. only really and Canada. And um, I started doing that. I did that for, I mean, from 2010 until... Pretty much 2015. Like hardcore 14. Ro- road dog in it. Yeah. 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 Yes, constantly. And, and and were you seeing that start to pay off in good ways? I have seen that pay off. Yeah. Good. I can, it's interesting what seems like nothing to, you know, industry people who want to make a lot of money is so much to me. Like I feel like getting to play the, I, you know, the five spot and sell it out. Mm-hmm. Those size clubs to me feels like an insurmountable task that I've had to work for every fan. This is a hard town to get people to come out to. I, this I town? Find, yeah. Here's the thing about this town. <laughs> Tell me. Once they've seen it and they know what it is, they're not interested anymore. Unless you sort of find a way to make it the party. You know what I mean? Like your show has to be the party. So when I was starting out here and on the scene and out and wanting to play all the time, which I suggest to anybody really trying to do it. Like it's the only way you get good. Um, We were a crew of 50 people who drank every night. And so if you booked our band, uh, 50 people would show up and drink and like the bar was happy and everybody was happy. And we're like, you don't need to pay us. We're good. We're just partying. (laughs) So there's like that vibe Uh that really works for creativity, for figuring things out and all that. Um, So you have here, you sort of, you know, it has to be special. And so I try to make it special when I'm here or I do like volunteer work. I'm doing a show for Planned Parenthood on the okay. anniversary of Roe versus Wade at Third mm-hmm. Man on yeah. January 22nd. And I'm helping to volunteer to, to organize the event. So there's just, you know, Nashville, if it's on the tour, I'll do it. If it's a special event, I'm definitely going to have a hometown show. Yeah. Just because of the immense amount of talent here can kind of really put on a nice big show. I've always had a dream of doing a regular residency here like um once a month and just doing a show like that um but there's plenty of venues that size also you could do anything you could go to d's yeah d's is cool you could go to uh the american legion 
post-182. Yeah. You could, um, if it was six years ago, go to the Stone Fox. Rest in peace. Yeah, that was a cool place. Yeah, yeah. the Legion was the one place I got to go a few times during the pandemic because Chris Scruggs was playing outdoors there. I might often. have been there. Yeah. My kid was like screaming, <laughs> yeah, running around. <laughs> I know you did. Yeah, um, <laughs> do you remember me? <laughs> uh, circling back to the record, because we didn't we didn't really talk about the the record, and I and I just want to understand a little bit too about how you guys make your records, mm -hmm. in particular this one. So, because yes. this is the one that I know the best, and because you're new to me, this is the one that I've like really do dove in, dive in into Dove deeply. Into. Dove into. Deeply. I understand the you. question you know what I'm there. Saying. No, I don't. Um, okay, so can you just tell me a little bit about the process? Like, uh, is it all just you and Buddy playing all the instruments, first of all? Um, for the most part, but we did have hags come in and play bass on um, Hot House Flower Upright Bass. And then okay. we had... Um, Andy Spore, who plays drums with me, and Linwood Regensburg plays bass, and they played on these some are, songs. These are guys, people in your band? Yes. Okay. Currently, yeah. yeah. They're in, like, you know, we've been playing together a lot lately. Um, they came in to do drum and rhythm tracks, and... Um, so so what was the actual order of making this record? Like, did you <laughs> did you do demos, then drum, like, yes. one at a time, all one at a time? Um, no, so it would... I would do the demos... Maybe pass it to Buddy, maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, demos go to the band. Band comes in and plays rhythm. How big is your space? Like, do you have room for like everybody? a basement on on one of those '60s ranches? Okay. Like, but yeah. it, the bottom floor was like nothing. So okay. we took half of it, and half of it's my vintage hoard. <laughs> oh, okay. So you got and then the other half is our studio. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So so rhythm section comes in. Yeah. And. We play that, and a lot of times Buddy and I will um, decide we like the, the electronic drums better. Or, But there's not a lot of electronic drums on that record, is there? Um, there's Maybe a few there songs, yeah. Okay. You can't really tell that's how good Buddy is. You really okay. won't be able to tell. Um, but there were some times where we did, like Andy came in on one song and um, on um, I Need Your Love. Mm -hmm. There's two drum parts that we gave Andy and then he just played both and then we mixed them together. You know, so there's weird stuff going on like that. But then once we have the rhythm tracks, if we decide we like it, which sometimes we didn't, um, but a lot of times we did. And those were going down bass and drums at the same time. Correct. Then um, Buddy and I would go in and play together on the other parts, sometimes keeping the vocal, sometimes not. Sometimes yeah. coming back and we do the vocal, but the guitars are mostly played together, the strummy stuff. Which are super cool. I love the layered guitar aspects. I think they're cleverly done. Like they're they they're not like rhythmically, they're not aping each other. There's sort of like a usually kind of some sort of contrasting thing going on between at least two guitars on a lot of that stuff. And that's a lot of Buddy because he'll layer. Yeah. He just gets in there and does all the, you know, then he might come in and do a solo or do something else. A lot of subtraction and addition, but with the goal in mind of it not feeling that way. So we really are trying not to make it, you know, be too dressed up. Very. It's sparse. We Right. So like that's a huge thing. It's like got to be. It's got to be pared down. It's got to be like kind of a scalpel, like, you know. So that was like a concept you were going for with this it's record. It's just in a particular. general vibe I've yeah. always had. Yeah. Like music is this, uh, the space between the notes. Like let's, you know, when you have no deadline and you're at home and there's no, you know, studio time, you have a lot, you could just layer, 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 you know, do totally. it. But you really have to, um, I think one of the tricks of, Production is, um, you know, finding that magical feel of the song where the lyrics feel right and everything feels. A lot of that is tempo, mm -hmm. and knowing that in keys and things like that. What do key you experiment with those elements much before you start tracking? The tempo is actually fixed when the song is written, and I know it to like three BPM. Like wow. I can't, like I, it, the lyrics don't feel right for me. Okay. So, yeah. um, 
So that's an interesting thing when you make a song that's too slow and then you're like, oh no, it's too slow, but it's almost done. <laughs> well, how fast can we make it with very speed without it sounding weird? There's a lot of that that really? happens for me. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of like getting to a place and realizing the tempo is not exactly right. But then Would we just like, are there some songs on the record that yeah, you like actually. Cool Blue is like deathly slow to me. Like I feel like oh, I'm yeah? just falling asleep listening to it. But that, you know, exaggerated uh, critique of my own work is funny because it's probably like four BPM too slow right, from what we'd right. like to do live. So we just. So how do you, how does that get through your process? Like, how do you not go back and be like, fuck it, we're going to do it faster? Because if you could try to do it over, you could mess it up. Right. You can't get it again. So you, you, you let things go. Who cares? And you're, a, you're able to let it go. Yeah, because it's not for me after it's made and right. I finished it. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm not one of those people who <laughs> listens to my own music. I'm with you. I'm like, I hear it in a, in a public setting by accident. I'll be like in Whole Foods and it'll come on the radio and I'm like, wow, that sounds good. <laughs> you know, moving on. The relief. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like very intense into what I'm currently doing and I really don't care about what is finished. Mm-hmm. Um, except that, and I feel proud of it all. So I, you know, I don't feel regretful or anything. So how do you, as a self-produced artist in your home studio with basically no, there's nobody telling you when you're done or anything like the record still is cool and sonically exciting and sparse. How do you intuition? Kind of, okay. Yeah. Listen, I listen in, in a world where lots of money's passing around, like, you know, you can say, let's find the most beautiful girl who can sing. And who cares if she can write? Let's get, we'll hire Joe. Joe can write. Okay, great. Let's get so-and-so. Now we're, we're in a world where it takes engineers to operate tape equipment. Okay, we'll get this great engineer who's also my buddy. And here we go. We have a million dollars and that's what you need. You need a producer. Producers are people who teach artists how to be able to make records, whatever that means. That could mean you tell some, you, you, you know, pick songs, you pick the best songs. Mm -hmm. Some people need, I mean, I would love to work with a producer and, and my relationship with my husband serves to have a, someone there to bounce ideas off of. So there mm -hmm. is somebody there, you know, being by yourself is not the best, you know, you do need someone to bounce. So there is the band for that, you know, buddy and, um, so there is someone to bounce ideas off of, but I do believe that all of this parsing out of roles and things is not necessary unless <laughs> there's just so much money going into it that you're, you're, you're at the top and you're managing a team to do the artist's job. I'm just, I just make music mm -hmm. and I have tools and I've learned the tools I need to be able to make something to a point for no money. Right. Because I don't, they're, they're, the budgets are gone. It is virtually impossible to make a profit. Anybody you see in music today that is a small record label or, you know, a musician is literally funding it with other money, whether it is from friends and family or another source of income, that's the way it works. Yeah. So for me, growing up in that environment, I've acclimated to, I'm not, I'm not atrophied in those ways because I know what I need to do to be able to get my art out into the world 2021. Yes. Like it. Um, like button hits. <laughs> um, do you, does it ever, is it a factor for you to be able to pull the songs off live? Yes. Okay. So that that's also a consideration when you're making a record that you don't want to like overdo things because you need yes. to. Okay. Because that's the caves disaster. <laughs> My second record. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. If you okay. go back and you listen to that one, um, that was the record um, that I got this amazing keyboard where you had all the beats yeah. and you had all the sounds and you could like take the beats apart. And I just started it and I was like, really into Echo and the Bunnymen and Kate Bush and all this yeah. like 80s new wave. And also like art rock, I guess. Uh -huh. So I was heavy into that vibe and I wrote all these songs on keyboard and I made this crazy record and then Buddy came in and he put all his crazy guitar parts down <laughs> and we were like, let's have electronic drums and live drums. And we had like 90 tracks. Oh my God, yeah. Then we got Stephen Haig who 
you know, is an, this amazing mixer who, you know, did Pet Shop Boys and all these hits. Wow. He came in to mix it and he put more stuff on. <laughs> and he was like, I'm a bass player. I'm going to play the bass over. He played amazing bass. And then, uh-huh. but yeah, and then he put all this stuff on and <laughs> it's a masterpiece. Then we go to play it live and, you know, there's four of us in an SUV. Yeah. And we're like a jazz band, right? Yeah. Four of us in an SUV and we're trying to play this record and, you know, my team's like, doesn't sound like the album. <laughs> yeah, no so shit. I'm like, okay, cool. Let me get some tracks. And and it's just not, it just doesn't. Tracks don't work. Everybody tries to do tracks. And I love it because I have friends and they'll be like seven or eight years younger than me and they're doing tracks. And I'm like, oh, it's the tracks phase. Mm-hmm. And then you're like me and you're like, fuck tracks. Mm-hmm. I got four talents here. Let's just all play melodies and let's just simplify this. Did you find a way to make it work? Like as far as caves? Yeah. No, it's just, just I mean, never worked live. Let me explain this to you. We don't even play songs off that album in a set in my sets. My sets are for five records. I have five records in one set. So if I'm opening a 45 minute set, I'm playing two songs off each record, two mm-hmm. or three songs off, probably more off the newest record. Yep. So caves is my poor, sad, beautiful child that <laughs> just gets, gets skipped, neglected. <laughs> totally skipped. And then people have to show, show her, like, I love no one's going to know. And I'm like, I'm never going to play that song. <laughs> but do you not think they could stand up on their own, like, as simplified songs? Or do they just need to be in that backdrop for you to make it work? It's, like, simplified. I'm not sure some of them are even songs. Do you okay. know what I mean? Yep. Like, you have to, you really, and, and playing live is so interesting because all of that comes out in the wash for playing live. But no, like, no one's going to know the way the beat is on the record. It's like it doesn't work. Or, or maybe it just needs to be found. found. Mm-hmm. And I just haven't put the time into finding it because I have songs that I can play with a guitar and sing right. that just work. Yeah. And this album, Aquatic Flowers, was written so that Buddy and I could just tour the two of totally. us yeah, I can and see play that. the songs. Yeah. And although it is missing the the band, and I, f- I love playing with a band more than anything, it just doesn't make any sense to play with a band anymore with the conditions of the work environment that we're in right now as musicians. And so is that what you're, like, are you doing duo shows? That, mm-hmm. That's and, it. And you're comfortable in that situation? I mean, you, yes. you, would, uh, yeah. you would love I get to have to, the band, I but... get to sleep in a bed in a, a decent <laughs> hotel. Yeah. And um, I get to eat healthy food and have money for vitamins. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it takes. You want to see a band? They're they're loading that gear in. They're playing for you. They've driven to your city, and they're eating peanut butter in the van after just to be able to do this. Yeah. Some, th- something's wrong, guys. Like, maybe the ticket price needs to go up. Mm-hmm. Maybe we need to have fair market price for our tickets and for our records. How much does it cost to do this? Where is my economist friend's? Telling Stepping me up. what what mm-hmm. does the price of vinyl need to be? What what did the prices actually need to be? No one's sorting that out. It's a mess. It is a mess. It is so pathetic. It makes me sad. But it doesn't matter because we're going to keep doing it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but no, I'm not bringing my band. I'm uh, putting my foot down on this. You want my band? You show me the money. Yeah. Fork anyway. it over. Um. I yeah. So I I see that you're playing your. In the new year, you're going out west, mm-hmm. doing some shows out there. So yeah. that's just the two of you. Yes. That's cool. It's a streamlined way to work. Can you tell me about your writing process a little bit? Like, do you, are you like a stockpiler of lyrics and melodies and things like that? Like, you're obviously, writing is a huge part of your life. So is it constantly going or? I think it's always like the ideas are always being written down um, lately because I'm just so busy with my personal life, I guess. Um Writing has to be like set out to do, but one of the things I can do is write a song if I need to write a song. Mm -hmm. So I kind of am spoiled in the way that I don't feel like I got to keep writing an exercise. Like I know that if I, if I go into, if I really do need exercise, like I can go in the week before and exercise and I'll be fine, you Mm -hmm. know? So, um, so I'm not obsessed with, I don't think that your ideas, I think your ideas become more important when you don't write in a way. For me, like I used like when to, you take time away from it, you mean? Yeah, where you just sort of like keep track of ideas, and then you sort of let the ones that just have to be born be born. Like okay. you just like when there's just an idea that is so good, because like, you can sit down and just pour. There was a time when I was co-writing a lot for um, just trying to f- see if that was something I wanted to do, and 
trying to crank. And there's there's a beauty of exercising that way too. But um, is that something that you've done much? Like in that I did. real Nashville kind of way? Where yeah, you're... so I got a publishing deal in 2013 and they we, we tried to do that. And within two months, I was like, this is a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I still co-write. Like I co-wrote the Vanessa Carlton record that just came out. I'm oh, cool. writing with her for her next record. Um, yep. So I still co-write, but it's more, you know, friends and more organic in that way. Right. Um, what not trying to write country hits. Well, not saying I'm going to write all the time. Yeah. I'm going to write, I'll write all the time if the right people are making records all at the same time. But mm-hmm. do you have like a phone full of uh, 8 billion ideas that are just waiting always. to always? Okay. And I've lost those phones. Like they've just died <laughs> and then my <laughs> life is gone for two years. There's a gap in, from 2014 now. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing. It's, there's a there's a term in psychology called libido, and when I learned this term, I was like, yes, this explains something to me about human nature. And I always used to talk about like, how do you get really good at guitar, like Buddy, you know? Well, Buddy picks up a guitar all the time and just plays. Well, what if I don't want to feel like doing that? Mm-hmm. Well, then you don't have the libido for it. And the desire, the libido for your art is something that you just have to have. Um, And I think that as human beings, we often fantasize about, well, like, for example, in relationships, sometimes you'll even pick someone who's different from you because you don't want to be like yourself. You want to be like somebody else. Like, oh, I'm so extroverted and talkative. Let me marry this wallflower, you know, (laughs) because he's so calm and he's so, he, when he says things, he really means it, you know, the beauty of the introvert, you know. So sometimes you're, you're attracted to maybe a profession or a lifestyle that isn't yours. Yeah. Well, you fantasize, like, I love the Beatles. I want to be John Lennon. But, you know, the libido for the work, the desire, the drive to do the work, if you don't have that, I guess you have to work it in another way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You have to make one record and try to promote it for seven years. But for me, the joy and the, uh, I mean, I get pleasure out of my work. And I've always been very focused on the work. And maybe that's why I stayed in Nashville, because my work doesn't really require more than, you know, that creative stable of musicians, a creative yeah. stable of friends to commiserate with. And um, I found that through the people here. And I found it the lifestyle when you're trying to tour and do all that, you know, conducive. Manageable. Yeah. Manageable. Yeah. What about the melodic side of things? Like, do you, is Pure that something? inspiration. Do you work hard on no. the, it just comes fast. It fast always and furious. comes fast. Really? It always comes fast. Yeah. It's like, I can just do it. I don't know what to tell you about that <laughs> other than I started when I was eight years old and I can do it and they're almost always good <laughs> and well, I can just do it. Like in the sense that the song kind of like you start working on it and you've just like got it. Is that? Yeah. Like if you played a chord progression right now, I could probably come up with a great melody within seconds. It's just. It's it's your thing. I can improvise like that. I can Uh do it. It's not hard for me. It's never been hard for me. It's. Do you ever get blocked in that way? Never never? blocked. Never. Wow. I'm never blocked. Okay. I understand not having the libido, Mm -hmm. but in that case, I don't, or the desire to do it. In that case, I never pressure myself to do it. You should see me. I'm watching like John Cassavetes films or like reading a book or or absorbing something else or I'm, you know, picking vintage. I mean, I have all these right. other hobbies that, you know. That probably helps a lot, I'm, I'm sure, like just, just keeping other parts of your brain going. I just immediately refocus on something else. Um, but I find inspiration in all those things and I find words in all those things and communicating, which is what you're doing And those phrases and those ideas are part of your everyday life. So you just have to kind of become an archivist. Like, "Mm, I want want Mm -hmm. that for an idea. Or you come up with a phrase and you just write it down. Yeah. What about influences as a songwriter? Like, it's kind of hard for me to tell when when I listen to your music. Genre? Not even, well, yeah. Oh, influences. I I know what you mean, the distinction. You're saying, like, I don't feel particularly, I mean, I know that I'm influenced But I feel just as influenced by like watching a great movie Mm -hmm. as about, you know, to me, it's about story. Uh, To me, it's about it's just sitting there and doing it like I can sit there and write and I can do it. It's just I don't I don't have much of an explanation other than (laughs) what about when you were eight and you you said you started writing songs when you're eight. Do you want to hear the first song I ever wrote? Yeah. I'll sing it for you right now. All right. Because it's amazing. You Imagine (laughs) a year old singing it. As I walk down this road. 
I think about the good times we had over the years. It was fun to know someone like him. He betrayed me for someone else. It was surprising at first, but it's true after all. But it's over now. Here comes the chorus. If you could see what he's done to me, he broke my heart. Okay, I remember that. It's like wow. burned in my head. But first of all, <laughs> that's intense for I have an two issues. <laughs> One is what was I watching on TV right. to teach me about such betrayal. Uh-huh. And also I used but twice in a row. I still sing yeah. it that way, which I would never do now. So just know. Do there rem- is room for improvement. Do you remember your second song, or is it just the first one is burned in your head? The like first that? one. The first one. You know, I ran in. I ran into an old friend of my mother's, who's a piano player, lifelong musician in Chicago. Yeah. And her husband, who's musician, bass player, lifelong musician, and they came to the show, and we had a beer afterwards. And she said, "You know, the first time I ever met you, you came to see a play at the high school, and because she taught music at a high school, Queen of Peace, an all girls school." In Chicago, and I, she said, when I met you, you know, we we said something about like, do you want to? Would you like to sing? I asked you if you'd like to sing a song for me, and you said, um, would you like to hear one you know or one that I've wrote? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I was probably that same age, yeah. so it was just something that I just started doing. And yeah, so you know. <laughs> at that point, were you listening to a lot of music? Like, you must have. It must have been something that you had ingrained in you. Yeah. So my father's a musician. Okay. And what kind of musician is he? What does he do? So my father would work six days a week as an engineer at uh, Lansing Airport, which is where I grew up, a suburb of Chicago. And Mm -hmm. he would install radios into airplanes during the day. And then on the weekends, he would play in wedding bands. And so he made his own record and he had his own songs somewhere. You know, gosh, I would probably probably was nine or ten, but he always had a home studio. Oh, and he always had recording equipment. Yes. Okay. So we had a living room or studio in our bedrooms, in this, in our house. Cool. um, Yes. That's a good way to grow up. It is a good way to grow up. And so when I was 14 and writing, you know, I was like, oh, dad, I can write songs, you know. Mm -hmm. And my dad started, said, well, let's record them. So we started real early with that idea. So, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm very impressionable at that. Those ages, you're a sponge. So I started the idea of, oh, I can make a song and then I can record it at home Mm -hmm. very, very early. I mean, my dad. Who were you, who were your heroes at that point though? Like musically, what? I, w- I sang Delta Dawn in the fourth grade talent show. I was really into um, No Doubt and yeah. uh, Cheryl Crow, all of the 90s, um, Lilith Fair, uh, Tori Amos. Um, but I was also into Fiona oldies. Apple, stuff like oh that Oh my God, too, Fiona yeah. Apple. Mm-hmm. No, but I was also o- always listening to oldies radio with my mom and my mom loved Dolly Parton. And uh, Tammy okay. Tucker. So I sang Delta Dawn in the talent yeah. show. Um, I sang, you know, uh, I'm trying to think Bette Midler. I used to love Bette oh, yeah. Midler. Yeah. So a little bit of musical What's theater. Not to love? There, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Beaches, still cry, still cry. <laughs> um, so, so as a child, you know, I was just absorbing, you know, Oldies 104.3 was a huge, you know, we were radio kids. So. Uh-huh. And then Q101 was the alternative radio station and where we heard everything. And so if it was played on the radio between, you know, 1985 and 1998. You were in. I know every word. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Burned. Do you have one of those memories where you can. Can't remember a number to save my life. But lyrics you you got. But I can remember an entire song or and learn learning, you know, if I like it. Did you ever play other people's songs? Like, did you ever playing a cover band or, or do yeah. gigs where you had to play covers or anything? When I started, mm-hmm. um, I had five original songs and I was four, 14 years old and this coffee shop opened in my town and I went down there and I said, can I have a gig? You know? And they're like, sure. Two hours. So <laughs> my da- I, I said to my dad, I was like, what are we going to do? He's like, well, we'll learn, we'll learn two, an hour and 45 <laughs> minutes covers. Yeah. Exactly. So we, we played all kinds of, my dad and I together played, you know, oh, so, so you many did gigs covers. with your dad. Oh yeah. Cool. At, at this coffee shop. And, um, I mean, we did all kinds of covers, yeah. all kinds of, I mean, just 
spanning. I mean, remember we used to do um, that Simon and Garfunkel song, Hello Darkness, and <laughs> we did Joni Mitchell. We, we loved the Beatles. So yeah, of course, learning covers. There's a weird thing in the suburbs, because I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, you know, like Chicago's on a grid system and zero is the middle of the city. And I grew up around 159th Street. Way down there. Mm-hmm. And there's a thing like, no, we don't do covers. There's this like you know, when you're an original musician, you feel very squashed in these other environments. So yeah. you think you don't have covers. But I feel, I still, um, I think it's really, really important to your education to learn other people's music. I think, I it, think so too, it really yeah. limits a lot of people's ability, even if they have like a libido and an intrinsic sort of melodic style. I think that um, like, you know, in your mind, exposing yourself to, you know, the relationship between chords and all that stuff. I think that you have to do that to really, to really like get to a point, to be able to get to a point where you can compete. Do you remember like as a musician learning songs and like putting together like, oh, that chord works with that chord and that chord is like a weird choice, but it works. Like, do you remember, do you remember that kind of part of the education? Um, So I started taking piano lessons when I was a kid and I sort of learned all the scales and all the chords from okay. my first piano teacher when I was nine. So you had nine. a basic theory knowledge. that Yes, always okay. had a basic theory of chords. And yeah. then I went on in high school to teach voice and piano to kids at this music shop in Blue Island that was run by another musician, Jerry. And he he um, kind of took me in. He knew, knew I could do it. And so I was teaching, you know, five, six, seven-year-olds how to play piano and in the process of that taking lessons and um, hanging out with like the guitar teacher who was Joe LaBanco, who was like long hair and loved metal. <laughs> um, and so I'd go in there once a week and teach my students and learn how to teach it and, mm-hmm. and think about it. And I, one of the things I did with my students, piano students, I always did chords and we learned songs because um, that's how I, that's like, I think how you really can engage people. I mean, it's just so spiritual. It's just so part of, it's therapeutic. It makes you feel good. You know, I yeah. can think about, I have a, a dramatic sense. I can think about that feeling and feel it a little bit, you know, and I love that. I love when I hear a good song and I want to hear it 40 times. Um, in fact, my son does that too. If he hears oh, a yeah. song, he's like, when it's like. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Yeah. And yeah. you try to get him to move off and you're like, no, you want to listen to like Yellow Submarine? He's like, no, <laughs> Down by the Bay. That was so last week. Mom. Yeah. yeah. Down by the Bay again, please. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> cool. What's your first instrument then, as far as you consider what you're most comfortable on? Piano, piano. or guitar? Piano. Okay. Mm-hmm. And when you play with Jenny Lewis, do you play? Keys. You do? Mainly. Okay. I keep seeing that as something referred to that you do. Like, is that a regular thing or was that just... 2015, yeah. That was like a one-off thing. Yeah, it was a year. Okay. You can't... It's such a... It's a full-time job doing that. Because you're gone so much and... um, That's what I did for a long time. Oh. Yeah. Not playing keys for somebody, but playing guitar for somebody. Yeah, in a band. And (laughs) But you think that you're going to be able to do your own thing as well, but um, it just... How did you end up doing that? She just asked you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I knew, you know, Mike Cave, who was the band leader at the time. I knew him and I knew Megan McCormick, who was in the band. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I just got asked and here's 26 songs learn them come up. out in two weeks and, yeah, learn them up. Yeah. Which and- is not my forte, <laughs> other people's music. Um, but... Uh, I figured out. I figured it out for Jenny Lewis, which is that's cool. Would you do it again with somebody else? Oh, it depends. Right. It was, so it wasn't like a burning need on your part to like go it out was and an be opportunity. somebody's. Okay. It was an yeah. opportunity that I found very challenging, and that I said yes to, and that I learned a lot from. But it wouldn't be something I would want to do long term because ultimately, I want to run out, grab that mic, and 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 go crazy uh-huh. on the mic and sing. And that's what I love to do. I love to write songs and I love to sing. And that gives me that fill that allows me to deal with the rest of touring, which mostly sucks. Sucks. <laughs> and so to be away from my family, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. it's like, uh, yeah, you, you can't really do that when you're if, somebody's keyboard player. If 25,000 people screaming for you fills you, you can do that job. But it never filled me. I never felt filled by the, quantity of it mm-hmm. I'm oh I, I you know although I enjoyed my role and I did I, I tried to, to be serving and supportive um it ultimately doesn't fill me the same way mm-hmm. as the other things that I do 
And um, was it easy for you musically? Like, no, was... and it's not easy for me musically okay. either. Yeah. What was the ch- hardest thing about it? I think it is hard for me to learn other people's songs. It's a very time consuming. It's not a natural thing. Mm-hmm. You know, as a songwriter and a musician in my band, what I do is sort of what I already do. And then I fill in, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't have to think about it. But when you're learning someone else's music, the way that I learn other people's music is Beck played this and Ben Montench played this. Give me the stems. Let me learn what someone else is playing. And that's yeah. hard for me mm-hmm. because I can say, oh, my my song is, you know, these chords, blah, 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 play whatever I feel, done. Right. But when it's somebody else's music, you have to, I think you have to honor the record that people have listened to for a year before they come to see the show. Mm-hmm. And you have to honor the songwriter enjoying it. Yeah. And it's, um, and I'm not, I mean, I, I would love to go there as a musician, but I'm just not, it's just not, there are people who do that job that I did for Jenny that that's what they do and they're, they're meant for that job absolutely oh, yeah. yeah and although i did provide a lot vocally mm-hmm. and i provide a lot in like teach me what you want i'm going to do what i'm supposed to do and i'll execute it as be- you know i'll try to get better execution every night and performance i'm into that it's like a play mm-hmm. you know as much as i'm into that role i think that um it's not when what I you're got, cut out for yeah when i got home i joined a band with a, a songwriter keish knight Brett Rosenberg, I love his music, and I joined it, and I was like, I can't do this. Because the fact of the matter is, is a finite amount of time in the day, and, like, you know, I procrastinate things that don't I don't have a desire for. Yeah, yeah. Really badly. Sure. If there's a job that I'm supposed to do, and I don't want to do it. There's a whole lot of gardening that happens. It's not ethical. Yeah, <laughs> it's, not, it's not ethical or non-ethical. It's called, like, I can't. The people in your band, though, do, do you think, are they career side people? Well, I think, like, if you're a drummer at heart, you're a drummer at heart. Right. There's no, like, you can't go out and be a, write songs and just play drums. I mean, you can. We've you gone home. I mean, you could 100% do that. <laughs> I think you have to have been in the band before you can do that. Um, I'm your fan. I love whatever you do. <laughs> um, so I think that there are some skills there are some instruments and skill sets that require collaboration. And I think there are people who are like, oh, like I'm best as this, or mm-hmm. I find work as this. Like oh, Linwood, who plays in my band, I mean, he can play drums, he can play bass, he can make stuff. Mm-hmm. But he finds he gets work playing bass and he enjoys it. And that's his thing. Um, I think that if someone came and said, I mean, I've been asked to be in bands, but it was like right after the baby came and I was like, I'm not going to tour, you know, for, I can't, you know, there's no way. Yeah, it's just impossible. Yeah. Especially in someone else's band. In my band, I can like set it up for myself. But mm-hmm. so that was just impossible. But um, yeah, most likely it would just have to be such an opportunity that I was like, this experience I need to have more than this line of work is what I want to be doing. Mm-hmm. When you go out on tour with Buddy, how do you guys manage the the kid? Like, do you bring him well, with we're you? Or? In a very big experimental phase. Luckily, and this is the only time anyone's ever said "luckily" and "pandemic" in the same <laughs> sentence. That sort of bought you a little time. It did buy me uh-huh. time. It was lovely. Yeah, it was amazing. I had no pressure to tour. Yeah, right when my child was one, and I was like, okay, cool. This is the all the things I've been needing to do to develop the ability to be creative. I'm just going to do here and can figure it, sort it out. But, you know, with the pandemic, there was no babysitting. It mm-hmm. was, it was a pressure all itself. So yep. I had to learn Absolutely. to just do it completely alone, which you know about because you have a 14 year old. I, uh, 15 now. 15 yeah. year old. Okay. Yeah. So, um, didn't do any of that. Now that we're doing it, we're like in experimental phases. We're trying to figure out what works. We left last time for 16 days and left him with grandma and papa, but that felt really a long. long time. Yeah. It felt like a little too, like actually a lot too long. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first experiment. And the next experiment is, I think it's. Because that, the chunk that I saw on your website, that's a sizable chunk, isn't it? Like you're doing all the West Coast stuff. 17 days now. That's. Okay. I think it's like 17 days. It's. That's with Julian and a nanny. The band that I was in right up to the pandemic was called Birds of Chicago. And they started touring with their daughter when she was three weeks old and never stopped. (laughs) Like they literally stayed on tour for six years with her, basically. 
Okay, yeah. so we did the Marquita Telethon, Marquita Bradshaw Telethon with Birds of Chicago. Um, that was like a volunteer thing. She was running for um, Senate. She got the okay. Democratic t- ticket here in uh-huh. Nashville, which was amazing because she's like, you know, an African-American woman and also kind of a socialist. So, Well, I'm Canadian, so yeah, I know all about those it. nasty socialists. I know. <laughs> We're all like filled with like joy and sharing and we live <laughs> really like wonderful lives with organic food and we don't have mansions. We're super nice cars, but <laughs> our quality of life is on point. And I think that um, all these capitalists are jealous of our time. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Are you planning to make another record or anything? Like what's yes. next? What? Okay. So how does it, tell me how that happens for you. Like, Obviously, the writing is not a problem. So what says to you, like, hey, it's time to make a record? Basically, the pandemic made it weird. But for Mm -hmm. me, the way that I visualize it is record comes out, tour the record, hit the places, start making a new record. Yeah. Takes two years always for me. Um, I always do something. I put out a record, tour it, do something else. So whether that's have a baby, open a vintage store, I don't know. Maybe I'll have another baby and write a record and make a record. I don't know. When Aquatic Flowers came out, so there was no touring. You've never toured, really. I'm just starting. Okay. To kind of hit everywhere. We it came out in June. Yeah. And we did. It was right in that weird time where we were Mm -hmm. thought the pandemic was over and we were vaccinated. Yeah. So luckily, we did a few shows. Um, How did that feel? It felt really weird to play a show after a year and a half of not it's definitely something that uh takes exercise and practice to do so felt really bizarre we were all nervous we're like what is this thing we feel right now (laughs) i'm feeling my heart palpitating and um i feel crazy um had you done much like virtual gig kind of situations at all during the pandemic we did some yeah i did a bunch of those i hated it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know, when we, when I did the Marquita telethon with Aaron Ray and William Tyler, we did it all virtual and it was super awesome, but it was a huge production and we had over 50 artists contributing videos. And so, yeah, I did some videos and I produced that show. And was I, I was I on that show with I the think Birds of Chicago? Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Submitting videos, right? You probably were in the video, right? Probably. And now I'm going to look back. Um, So we, so like we did some big production, like really ambitious, creative things with streaming that I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Um, But, and I did a couple of live streams, like it was the 10 year anniversary of my first record. And then we did the record at the five spot. You know, we did like a live stream that way. Oh, like an empty five spot? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. They, they really got their, their live stream vibe together and it was really nice you just go five blocks down and they'll take care of it for you but we you know we I don't know I I I guess I just um was overwhelmed with the anxiety of it all and I just I'm just not ambitious in like I need to well listen I don't have like a financial pressure anymore to like make money doing it it's not I have the shop which the shop closed down and I did lose that income and I Mm -hmm. did go on unemployment but which I encourage people to do I didn't have to make money doing music so i started a patreon i released poetry and music and went through some old hard drives and kind of developed that and i also worked on um merchandise and Mm -hmm. got some merch together and i kind of developed my online merch vibe yeah which i had never had time to do because i was rehearsing and (laughs) doing gigs yeah So um, I got kind of that, those ducks in a row, and I produced a couple of, you know, charity events. There's a lot of, I had a lot of anxiety and I felt it very difficult to be creative with Donald Trump and what was happening with that election. And, you know, I I have a zine that I do here, which is like a voter guide. It's called Please Vote Nashville. And it's Davidson County, basically a a guide to every ballot in Davidson County. And we have a beautiful artist, Cami Berrigan, who illustrates it and we have volunteer writers who submit profiles it's very um nonpartisan. it's mm-hmm. just a guide it's educational and so we started we were doing that and i'm saying this as like a late 30s person i'm not saying this to you 22 year olds out there it takes a long time to figure all that out but um i do think that there's this 
vow of poverty. There's this dedication that makes people sad because it's not going to give you what you're looking for. And and so you do have to have your center and things outside of it, your art. It right. cannot be that all of you, um, because it really, that's just, a lot of that's just your ambition. And ambition is good because ambition takes you where you want to go. But if you have too much ambition, you become like a, a meteorite and you're just fiery and you're burning everyone yeah. around you and nothing can satisfy you. You just gobble everything thing up. And I, I'm saying this not because I think other people are like this. I'm saying this as a critique of myself that I see in other people mm -hmm. now that I'm a little older. But, you know, it's it's you have to find the life outside of it. And, and artists need to realize that when they ask people to open the shows or they ask people to play in the bands. Like, yeah. you need to pay people enough, guys. Let's stop letting these agents tell us that this number is the number just because someone will pay to play. Mm -hmm. It's We need to start saying, no, as an artist, I'm going to give this much to my opener because I know that a hotel, a decent hotel room is $150 a night. I yep. know that. Um, and then also, you know, I'm going to respect my band members and know that their significant others are suffering when they're away. And I'm going to make it, you know, take that into consideration um, when I'm asking of you and, and take it easy on you, knowing that I'm asking a lot. A lot of people don't do that. No, <laughs> this this industry is driven with egos. And, and, and I think that one of the good things about me jumping into both roles, you know, yeah is that I can sort of see like, you know, the drawbacks. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it takes a gig with Jenny Lewis to not that it's mm -hmm. her in particular, but just like having a side person gig yeah. to really understand what that's like to bring on those people to play your music. It gives you perspective. And yeah. you know what? I think that every person who goes to restaurants all the time should have to be a waiter for right. a year. Yeah. Just be a waiter for a year. I think there should be like, you know, service that you have to at 18, you have to be a waiter, you have to do all these things so that you can become a decent human being in society. I think it's understanding that being a waiter is a skill and it requires a lot of multitasking and it's a hard job. It's a physical job. Sure. Can make you... Um, just, like being a musician. Just hook it up on the tip. That's all you have to do. <laughs> all you have to do is hook it up. Uh-huh. If you hook it up and you chill out about assessing and evaluating the experience you had and just know that someone cooked it for you and they cooked better than you can cook. Yeah. Saying a lot. And you're just going to sit down and eat it and walk away. You don't have to clean the dishes. You don't have to. You didn't even have to source the uh, food. You didn't have to provide it. Yeah. Someone did all of that for you. That's what you're paying for. You know, you're not going to go hungry. You, you you can afford it. You're living large. Hook it up on the tip. <laughs> and and relax about whether your experience was perfect or not. And I think you're going to be okay. This message brought to you by Tristan. PSA 2021. <laughs> um, well, thank you for, for everything. But talking to me about all this interesting stuff and the record. I love the record. Can't wait to see what you do next. Yay. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. All right, folks, that was my conversation with Tristan. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a real honor uh, having her on the show and getting a chance to speak to her about all that stuff. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll be back in a couple weeks for another chilling episode of Music Makers and Soul Shakers. We'll see you then. Music Makers and Soul Shakers is produced at the Hen House Studio in Nashville, Tennessee by Steve Dawson. Please remember to subscribe to the show and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can find more info on this episode, including show notes and an audio playlist at makersandshakerspodcast.com. Thanks again to our amazing sponsors this season, Ear Trumpet Labs, Union Tube and Transistor, Black Mountain Picks, Isotope, and Spectra 1964. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>